Okay, so Dr. Eric Bernstein is our first speaker. Uh, he's with the Northern New Mexico Cancer Care here at the Medical Center. Uh, he is going to talk on basic epidemiology for patients with breast cancer, the numbers that really matter. And I think many of you know Dr. Bernstein. He helped us out with a seminar on lymphoma about a year ago. Uh, he's a board-certified uh, oncologist, hematologist, and we're delighted to have him here at the Medical Center. Dr. Bernstein? Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, it's always fun to talk to people in Los Alamos because everybody's always very curious. So I know some of you have had or have breast cancer, and I know that some of you don't. Um, and so it's nice to have a mix of folks who are just interested and who are personally interested. And um, thanks for having me. I'd like to thank the Council on Cancer. It's sort of a unique organization, um, and I th think it fits in really well with Los Alamos because the emphasis is really on education. So twice a year they put on a seminar for folks, and it seems to be really well received. And um, So thanks for coming out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about just basic numbers and kind of how oncologists think about breast cancer, at least how we should think about breast cancer. Because when you talk to a lot of patients, their experience is, well, I had surgery. I went to the oncologist. They said I needed chemotherapy. So I got chemotherapy, which to me is not really how it should work. Um, I, I, ideally, patients make decisions based on information that we share to them in a way that is helpful. Um, you know, in the 50s, it was very different. I sort of dream about being an oncologist. In the 50s, sometimes, there weren't a lot of drugs, but you didn't have to, you just sort of told people what to do, and people actually listened to you back then. Now it's much more complicated. Um, but I think it is more fun now, because you develop more of a relationship with your patients. Um, so to start off at a really basic level, uh, we're going to talk about breast cancer. And breast cancer is a cancer that starts in the breast. And if it spreads to other areas, it's still breast cancer. So I'll meet people who say, you know, this person has bone cancer and liver cancer and breast cancer and brain cancer. We define cancer as oncologists as where the cancer started. So breast cancer, if it starts in the breast and goes somewhere else, it is still breast cancer. And so that's an important point. Um, and breast cancer is very common, especially in women. So breast cancer in men, I'm not going to address. So nobody's walked out. That's good. Um, there's only about 2,000 cases of breast cancer in men per year. So when we look at numbers for breast cancer, when we look at all of these things that I'm going to be talking about, they don't, for the most part, apply to men, because that's a rare disease. And one nice thing about having a common disease is we have good numbers. You know, we don't have studies with three people who had this disease, and two of them did well, and one of them didn't. We have studies with 3,000 women who've had this disease. And so we have very good numbers in how people do with different types of therapies, what sorts of risk factors affect people. Um, unfortunately, it is really common. So if we look at new cancer cases in the US, a third of the uh, new cancer cases in women are breast cancer. It's a very common disease. Um, as you can see, 29% breast cancer, 14% lung cancer. The good thing about breast cancer is we're much better at treating it than many other cancers. So, uh, lifetime probability of developing cancer for women, if you live long enough, if you live an average age, one in three people will develop some type of non-skin cancer type cancer. Breast cancer will develop in one in eight women. So it's a very common disease. If you look at how many people actually die from breast cancer, the lung cancer and the breast cancer flip places because we're much more effective at finding breast cancer early, we're much more effective at treating it than we are with lung cancer. If you look here, this is uh, looking at trends in different cancers. And it's always, you know, everybody always says, oh, cancer's on the rise. It's actually not. Cancer deaths in an age-corrected uh, model are actually going down in the US. And if you look at giant trends, as much as I'd like to claim that oncologists are really making the big differences, we're not. The biggest difference is a guy named Richard Bonsack, who invented the commercial cigarette roller in 1930, has actually killed more people in America than anyone. So that's when people went from smoking a cigarette on Friday to smoking three packs a day. And over time, people smoke more and more. And as you can see here, lung cancer has gone up to the number one killer. It is leveled off as cigarette consumption is leveled off 10 years after cigarette consumption leveled off. And it's now headed down as tobacco consumption is headed down. Uterine cancer, eh, we can take some credit for that. That's a surgical disease for the most part. We've gotten much better at treating that with surgery. 
You can see that breast cancer, that mortality or death from breast cancer has actually gone down a little bit. And then the other big one is stomach cancer here. And we owe that to refrigeration largely. So we no longer preserve all our meats with nitrites. And so the fridge, saving all those lives. Who thought it was just for ice cream? Um, so those are the big drivers of mortality. Okay, so breast cancer. Tonight I want to talk a little bit about, about who gets it. Um, can you be the person who doesn't get it? Is there a way to not get it? Who dies from it? And if you have it, can you not be that person? So here's a very simplified oncologist's view of life. People are born, most of them do not have cancer. At some point, many people get cancer. Then you end up in one of three groups. Alive with cancer, alive without cancer, not alive. We do look at some more subtle things about people. <laughs> That's a very simplified version. So, since we're in a church, I thought I'd bring up this prayer. Uh, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. So, I'm not going to be able to help anybody with serenity or courage, but hopefully impart a little bit of wisdom to figure out how you can change what group you might be in. Um, so, if you don't have cancer, what can you do to keep from getting it? Well, I want to talk a little bit about how we look at that as an epidemiologist or an oncologist. And what we look at is something called relative risk. So if all we know about you is you're somebody out there in the population, you're at average risk. And that gives you a relative risk of one, meaning that you're at the same risk as everybody else. As we get more information about you, we can figure out things that might put you at higher or lower risk. So for instance, if you're a man, you're at much lower risk than a woman for breast cancer. If you were a smoker, you were at much higher risks for pretty much all the things that kill Americans. Coronary disease, cancer, strokes. So the way we look at that is, if you have a relative risk of two, that means you're going to be at twice the risk for having any event over a given period of time. So for instance, over a year, your risk of getting breast cancer with a relative risk of two would be twice the average population. A relative risk of 0.5 would mean that you have half the risk of the general population. So over the next year, you would have half the risk of developing breast cancer as the average person. So these are some of the known, and does that make sense? Does that seem clear to folks? Sort of, anybody? Okay. So, these are risk factors that are associated with breast cancer. If you have a mother or sister with breast cancer, your relative risk is 2.6. Can you change that? No. If you get rid of that mother or that sister, you're still carrying the genetic information, that relative risk remains. Age. So you're at low risk if you're young. As time goes on, your risk increases. So looking at somebody whose age is 70 to 74, versus in your 30s, your relative risk is going to be 18 times higher. Is there a way to avoid that? Although there are, <laughs> there are a couple of physicians in Santa Fe that may be telling you something that they say can help you to avoid that. It will not unless it kills you. So this is unfortunately a risk factor that we also cannot change. Age at menarche. Menarche is something that most people don't use that term. That means when you have your first period. So if you had your first period, when you were older than 14, as compared to people at their first period at age under 12, 1.5 times uh, more risk for the people who are, had it early. And that's because they get more estrogen exposure over time. Age at first birth, low risk if you have your first child when you are under 20 years of age, higher risk if you have your first child over the age of 30. Is this a reason to have a child earlier? I'm glad I'm not giving this talk at high school. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a reason necessarily to pick when you have a child, but it does affect your risk of breast cancer. Age at menopause, another thing that's hard to change, but that can put people at up to twice the risk depending on when you have menopause. So the later, the worse in terms of breast cancer. Use of oral contraceptives, a very small modification in risks. So people who've used oral contraceptives, depending on what study you look at, any from, anywhere from 1.07 to 1.2, a little bit higher risk. Hormone replacement therapy, which, you know, if you've never used it versus people who are taking it, 
a 20%, so 1.2 risk compared to the general population, which ends up being a very small difference in absolute breast cancer risk. But you know, when this study came out, <sighs> Premarin just went away, other than for people who have very severe menopausal symptoms, and then it's a reasonable choice. It's not a huge change in risk, but it is a change in risk. Alcohol, two to five drinks a day versus none, 1.4. So this is a modifiable risk factor. You'll notice there's a gray area here. That's one drink a day. Um, breast density. This is a mammographic definition. So if when we do a mammogram, they can digitally measure your, or subjectively measure your breast density. If that's greater than 75%, you're actually at an increased risk of developing breast cancer. It can also make it a little bit harder to find breast cancer on a mammogram. So women with very dense breasts may benefit from being screened with MRIs versus mammograms. That's a whole nother talk. It's kind of boring, but we're not going to address it. So bone density. And this one's not as well understood, but it probably has to do with estrogen receptors or estrogen itself. People who have low bone density are actually at decreased risk as compared to people who have higher bone density for breast cancer. So any of you who have low bone density, there's the good news about that. You know, I feel like it's, it's gotten very competitive with the older women in terms of breast density. Um, and you know, all of these are changes in the odds. So you can have none of these factors and you can still get breast cancer. You can have all these factors and never get breast cancer. So, you know, everybody always brings up the, you know, they've got, well, my aunt lived to 112, she smoked four packs a day, drank like a fish, and yeah, some people just get lucky. Um, what can you do to protect yourself? Well, breastfeeding. If you breastfeed for 16 months or more, that reduces your risk by about 27%. So, that's something to think about. Having kids. You have a lot of kids, five or more kids. That is a lot of work for a 29% reduction in breast cancer risk. But if you're at four, you know, that last kid may be worth it. Um, here's one that's easily modifiable and can help you with other things. So this reduces your risk of coronary disease, all these other things that can kill you. Recreational exercise. If you exercise on any regular basis, 30% decrease in risk. This is interesting. Postmenopausal BMI, which is a body mass index. So basically, it looks at your height and your weight and how round are you. Um, Premenopausal, it doesn't make any difference, actually, with breast cancer. There's actually, when they look at different studies, they've not been able to establish a clear correlation. But postmenopausal, it's important. So, right when you start getting hot flashes, you just got to start working out all the time and lose some weight. Um, I, there's no, you know, I, this is one where I think having a healthy body weight is beneficial for other reasons, but postmenopausal, it seems to be especially important for breast cancer. Having an ophorectomy before age 35, so having your ovaries removed before age 35, big reduction in risk, 70% reduction in risk, so a, a relative risk of 0.3. And this is one that we would consider in women who have hereditary breast cancer syndromes, which Dr. Zerbach's gonna talk about, because you can dramatically reduce people's risk by doing that. Um, aspirin, actually associated with a decreased risk of breast cancer. So that's another easily modifiable risk factor. Okay, so what if you've already got breast cancer? And all those numbers, those probabilities don't matter. You know, it's like the person who goes to the casino, hits the button once, comes out with a million dollars. People lose money at casinos, but that person won. Some people lose. And if you already have breast cancer, you already have it. So the other probabilities that we talked about doesn't matter. You got it. So nobody has just breast cancer. Everybody has a different breast cancer. People will have an experience with breast cancer and talk to somebody else with breast cancer, and it's a completely different disease. So the questions are, where is your breast cancer? What type of breast cancer do you have? What other health problems do you have? How old are you? How active are you? Are you in a wheelchair? Are you a marathon runner? You know, how healthy are you? So all those things are really important. And part of that is our ability to predict what's gonna happen with your breast cancer and how we can change that. Part of our ability is to predict that what's gonna happen to you. You know, if you're gonna get hit with a bus in two weeks and I was psychic, probably not gonna give you chemotherapy to prevent it from coming back. Okay. So here, another simplified version 
All right, so now you've got cancer. You don't want to go here. You don't want to be the dead person. That's the worst choice. You'd rather not be alive with cancer. You'd, you'd rather be alive without cancer if you can do that. What can you do to change the odds of you being alive without cancer? To determine that, the first thing we need to do is stage your breast cancer. And staging breast cancer is basically a system to describe where a patient's breast cancer is. Okay? And, and I think it's an intimidating word, and the process of getting staged is both frustrating and um, confusing for patients oftentimes because we don't talk about it as much as we should as oncologists, I think. Um, but we need to know exactly where you have breast cancer. And the reason for that is it, it is very helpful in us predicting the risk of it coming back. So, you know, you always hear, you don't always hear, sometimes you will hear when people come to my office, they go, well, the surgeon said they got it all. And I go, well, yeah, they got it all, but there's still a chance that there's microscopic disease somewhere else. And so that chance we can predict to some degree with staging, and that's important. So, uh, and that helps us to predict the risk of it coming back after either surgery, surgery and radiation, or surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. So the staging system, there's four stages, one through four. And one being the earliest stage, so a small tumor that is within the breast. Four being tumors or cancer that has spread to distant areas. Most commonly, it spreads to distant areas through the blood. Breast cancer usually spreads two ways, either through the lymphatic system, which is where it spreads locally to lymph nodes, or they told me not to touch that, um, or it spreads through the blood, and it can go to distant areas and then start growing. Breast cancer is what we call a TNM staging system. So tumors, that's the size of the tumor, is the N. N is nodes, I'm just sorry I said the N tonight, is the T. T is for tumor, how big the tumor is, whether it involves a chest wall, things like that. N is nodes, so how many lymph nodes are involved and which lymph nodes are involved. And then metastases is whether it is spread to distant areas. So that's usually through the blood, although it can go to distant areas through the lymphatic system as well. Um, there's zero through four for the tumor measurement. So there is zero through three for nodal involvement and zero through one are metastases. You've either got them or you don't. And this slide, as small as it looks now, looks even smaller over there. I looked at it on a monitor and I thought, yeah, it's kind of hard to read. I'm not going to do a lot of detail about this. This is the staging system. It's really small. Um, you don't need to know any of this. I didn't want to go into a whole lot of detail about staging, but it just outlines all the different TNM things. And the point of this slide is basically to say that there are a lot of nuances there. Okay, we don't just pick a number like two, three, done. Um, so, but it's not, it, so, and sometimes it'll be hard to tell the difference. So if you're newly diagnosed with breast cancer, we may get one type of imaging study and there's something that's a little unclear. So then we may get another type of imaging study. And as a patient, that can be very frustrating. But the reason we do that is because we want to be very clear about exactly what parts of your body are involved. So like I said, why do we care? Because it allows us to predict the risk of recurrence. And so by predicting the risk of things coming back, we can then predict what your benefit is going to be with hormone therapy or with chemotherapy. And patients who get hormone therapy have to have estrogen receptors on their tumor. So when we look at breast cancers, we can test for estrogen receptors. Patients who have those, the tumors will shrink if they're still in you. And we can decrease the risk of it coming back if the tumor is gone by giving people hormone treatments. So tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, things like that. Um, if you do not have hormone receptors, then we can use chemotherapy for that. And people who have hormone receptors, we can use both chemotherapy and hormone receptors. I mean, I'm sorry, both chemotherapy and hormone drugs, like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. Okay, so those are called adjuvant therapies. Adjuvant means added to. So you have surgery, because as one of my professors in med school told me, he, got, he, he had a little thing in his lung, and they wanted to watch it. And he said, that's fine if you want to watch it in a jar, because if, uh, if you have cancer, it's almost always better to have it out if it is small and localized. So adjuvant therapies are things we use in addition to surgery. 
Um, usually, if patients want to do breast conserving surgery, you will then have adjuvant radiation therapy. Sometimes we'll use that when the margins of the tumor, when they cut it out, were very close. So we can use adjuvant radiation, we can use adjuvant hormone therapies, and adjuvant chemotherapy. Neoadjuvant therapies are therapies that we add to surgery before we do surgery. And the reason we use neoadjuvant therapies are because you don't have to delay them for surgery. So sometimes when people have surgery, it takes a while to heal, it takes a while to get better, and then you have to get your chemotherapy later. And sometimes we do it because it allows us to do surgery easier. If you have a big mass, it's harder to take out than a small mass. And the other reason is it tells us if it's working. So we can watch the tumor, and if it shrinks and you have a great response to therapy, that tells us biologically that this chemotherapy is working well. So the choice between adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy is sometimes difficult. I'm not going to go into that a whole lot. So how do we know when to use chemotherapy or when to use hormone therapy at all? And like anything else, there are risks and benefits to both of them. So the risks are the side effects of whatever therapy it is, and they all have side effects. Um, and they're all different. And whatever side effects somebody else's therapy had, yours are not going to have the same side effects. So if I give two people the same chemotherapy, they're going to have different side effects. And if I give them different chemotherapies, they're going to be very different. And this is important because people often get great advice from people who really want to help them, but who may have a totally different uh, cancer. They may have gotten totally different therapies. And so it's best to do your own research, but also talk to your oncologist about it. Try to understand you know, what is the average experience with this type of uh, disease. Um, inconvenience. You've got to come to the hospital a bunch, get your treatments. You've got to see me on a regular basis. Cost can be a big factor. And psychology. I mean, some of these are really stressful for patients. And sometimes not getting treated is really stressful for patients. Sometimes the most difficult time is at the end of your therapy when you're done and you're not doing anything. So for some patients, it's actually, I think, psychologically easier to be treated than to not be treated, and everybody's different. The benefits basically are a decrease in the risk of recurrence or a decrease in the risk of dying from cancer. So recurrence means the cancer coming back, so you have evidence of cancer after it's been cut out. It doesn't mean you're going to die. So people have recurrences, and they don't die. We can then take it out surgically. We can use radiation. We can treat things locally. And for me, with most of these, we're going to be talking about death for two reasons. It's the most important endpoint, and also it's the easiest one to measure. One of the reasons I went into oncology is there's so many things in medicine, it's hard to figure out whether things work or not. Oncology, it's a lot easier, because it is a more lethal disease, and the time frame is generally shorter. So we're able to figure out whether drugs work or not. So for risk reduction, there's two big categories of risk reduction. There's relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. So relative risk reduction is what... Um, is, is uh, what drug companies will tell you, what somebody who's trying to sell you something is going to tell you. Um, an absolute risk reduction is a much more helpful number. And so to, take an, to get an absolute risk reduction, you take the risk the person is at in the first place, and you multiply it times the relative risk reduction. Okay? So if I had really great malaria prophylaxis that's cheap, doesn't have any side effects, and I give it to you all, that doesn't make any sense because you don't get malaria in Los Alamos. So there'd be no risk reduction. There'd be no absolute risk reduction, even though the relative risk reduction may be 50%, because you're not at risk. So if we have a patient who, based on staging, they have a 10% chance of their disease coming back, and we have some pretty effective therapy that can reduce that chance of coming back by 50%, the absolute risk reduction is only 5%. So this person was at relatively low risk to have their disease come back. They have pretty good therapy. So then we end up with a 5% risk reduction. We just go from 10% chance to 5% chance of this coming back. Is that worth doing? It depends on that person and you know, each individual. So that's a conversation that I would have with them. Here's another person. They have a higher stage. So this person has a more aggressive tumor. Maybe nodes are involved. They have a 60% chance of recurrence. Same therapy, 50% relative risk reduction. So now 50% times 60% is a 30% absolute risk reduction. So their odds of having their disease come back go down from 60% to 30% with treatment. Is that worth doing? Probably. 
So staging is important. This is the same treatment, same effectiveness, but different risk to start with. So which terms? Drug companies, they always use relative risk reduction. You know, you see all these glossy ads, blah, 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 50% risk or 60% risk reduction. What does that mean for you? You gotta figure out what your baseline risk is, and then you need to use those numbers and figure out what your absolute risk reduction is. Because that's the way I think. I mean, if somebody told me I had a 50% decreased risk of having my cancer come back, who wouldn't do that? But that may be a 2% absolute risk reduction for a difficult to take therapy. So for me, I always use absolute risk reduction with patients. Um, and you know, these are numbers that if you're being treated for cancer, you should be talking about with your oncologist. Don't be afraid to put your oncologist on the spot. It's good to make them uncomfortable, up to a point unless it's me. Okay, so this is a tool I actually use, some of you probably have seen this before, that I will use in clinic. So this is somebody who's 60, and this is a, a tool called Adjuvant Online. You can access this, I think you're supposed to say you're a doctor and a health provider, but they don't check your diploma. Um, and the reason for that is it's a little hard to make sure you enter all the stuff accurately, and somebody should talk to you about these results. But basically, this is a 60-year-old woman who had an estrogen receptor positive tumor, it was high grade, had four to nine lymph nodes involved, and their tumor was, let's say, two and a half centimeters. So 10 years from now, if we do nothing else, 34% of these women are gonna be alive. If we add hormone therapy, 13% or 13 out of 100 more women are gonna be alive. So that seems like a reasonable thing to do. That's a pill a day, you know? If you add chemotherapy, 17% of those women 17% more would be alive if you just did chemotherapy, okay? When you put the two together, you can't just add them because your actual risk before you get the other treatment goes down. So when you put the two together, you get a total of 28% decreased risk of dying from your cancer. So this is somebody who I would suggest that they get hormone therapy and chemotherapy based on this strong data that it's gonna decrease the odds of them dying by 28%. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So this is somebody who's generally healthy but 75, another estrogen receptor positive tumor but lower grade with no lymph nodes involved. Okay, so a lot smaller tumor, or a little smaller tumor, but not as locally advanced, no lymph nodes. If we did nothing else here, 64% of women in this situation are gonna be alive in 10 years. Now, 8% of the women who die are gonna die because of cancer, but 28% of the women who die are gonna die from other causes. That's because of the age, okay? So this is, you don't, try, you don't get breast cancer that comes into your office in a little Tupperware thing. It comes with the whole rest of the person. So if somebody's about to die, it's a completely different situation than somebody who's very healthy. So this person, if we add hormone therapy, we decrease their risk of dying by 2%. If we add chemotherapy, we decrease their risk of dying by 3%. So if we do both together, we decrease their risk of dying by 4%. Would you do chemotherapy or hormone therapy for this person? I'd be pretty hesitant, in all honesty. I would probably recommend that they don't. But I'd also talk to them about these numbers and see what they think about that. So we have some other tools that go beyond staging. Um, because some women are really sitting the fence, okay? That's a woman who we may want to do some more testing about, and we might want to get more information because it may change some of those numbers. And there are a lot of different tests out there. Um, the most well-validated, and what I mean by that is the most well-studied and the one having the most data to back up their numbers is something called the Oncotype DX uh, test. It looks at 21 genes, and we get a number based on the analysis of those genes. So it's a 21 gene recurrence score because the number we get is called a recurrence score. There are some others. There's a MAMA print, which is a Amsterdam 70 gene profile. That one sounds cool, not quite as well validated. Um, there's the PAM 50 score, which I've never used. I don't, I don't think it's used clinically much. It's more of a research tool and um, not that familiar with it. But I wanted to show you an example of how we'd use that. So this is a 60-year-old lady a medium grade tumor, two and a half centimeters, 75% chance of being alive in 10 years. 5% chance, or increased chance of being alive with the addition of hormone therapy, 
6% chance if we add chemotherapy, 6% uh, improvement, and 9% total with both chemotherapy and hormone therapy. Would you give her chemotherapy? So, you know, th that's going to be, I think this is, re you know, for most women, a reasonable choice. This is harder, it's difficult to know. And for women who are sort of sitting that fence in the, th I'm going to say 4 to 6% benefit, where it's difficult to make those decisions, that's when we use the Oncotype DX test. For women with negative lymph nodes, so their lymph nodes aren't involved, but who have estrogen receptor positive tumors. And so we would order an Oncotype DX test. And basically, you get a recurrent score. If it's low, that tells us this woman will get no benefit from chemotherapy. So when we look at these small numbers, a 3% decreased risk of dying, that means I gave 97 women that treatment didn't do them any good, okay? There were three women out of 100 who we really helped. And that's the purpose of this test, is to narrow down who those women are. So if you have a low recurrent score, you are very unlikely to be the woman who benefits from chemotherapy. So with a low recurrent score, we generally not do chemotherapy for estrogen receptor positive tumors that are early stage. If you have a high recurrent score, that tells us you're much more likely to be one of that 3%, one of those women who's going to benefit from the chemotherapy. So then we would consider doing chemotherapy. We used to just not know who was going to benefit and not have any of these numbers. So we just give everybody everything we had because that's what you did. Since then, we've gotten much more sophisticated in our choice of therapies. Um, so with our patient, this, would really, this decision would basically hinge on the recurrent score. If she has a low recurrent score, I wouldn't do any chemotherapy. I'd do hormone therapy alone. If she has a high recurrent score, then that would tell us she's much more likely to benefit from chemotherapy. And if she didn't get chemotherapy, she'd be at much higher risk to have her disease come back. So then we would do chemotherapy. Intermediate recurrent score, totally not satisfying. Then your patient has waited for like two weeks. They come back to see you and you go, eh, wasn't really helpful. They say, what? I got a bill for $2,000. Um, and you go, sorry. Um, but it, and it, so it's hard to know when to use these tests sometimes because the recurrent score, if it's not high or low, it really doesn't help us much. And so that's what some of the newer tests are looking at, but they have not been as well validated. So in summary, everybody's different, and it's important to understand the numbers that are pertinent to your cancer. Um, it's your doctor's job to explain those. Don't let questions hang out. If you have questions, write them down. If they come up later, make another appointment. You know, it's our job to answer those questions. And if I can't answer that question, I should either explain to you why that's an unanswerable question, or I should be able to get you to somebody who can answer it, or I should do a little research and get the answer for you. And it should make sense to you. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to me. OK? Thank you very much, Eric. Um, We'll go ahead uh, with our next speaker, and remember to write your questions down on the cards, and we'll pick them up towards the end and um, make sure we try and answer most of your questions. So our next speaker is Dr. Catherine Zerbach, and uh, she has also been gracious enough to speak at one of our other seminars. Dr. Zerbach is a board-certified uh, breast surgeon and uh, does uh, exceptional work in breast surgery, and we're lucky to have her here in Los Alamos. Um, she also is an expert on these hereditary types of breast cancers uh, and the uh, genetic uh, basis of those. And so I'm very pleased to be able to announce uh, her talk tonight on identifying and managing hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. Catherine. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Great. Um, gosh, Dr. Bernstein was terrific, wasn't he? He's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> I like to start this talk actually with a little pop quiz. It's kind of the pre-test, and then at the end we'll do the post-test where you ask me the questions. Um, most of you who've been in this area, northern New Mexico, for any length of time 
are familiar with the fact that there are a number of our Hispanic families who carry these gene mutations uh, via their Sephardic heritage that was brought over with the Spanish uh, when they came and conquered this area of the world, <clears throat> this part of the world. The pop quiz question is, consequently, which county in New Mexico has the highest per capita risk for breast cancer? Rio Riva? Any other guesses? Thoughts? Nope. It's Los Alamos County. The biggest risk factors on a per capita basis are being female, being Caucasian, being 65 or older. Okay? But we'll talk about a number of different uh, issues related to risk here as we go along. Okay, there's the disclaimer. I don't get any money from the company for doing this. It's just an educational uh, venue. And the things we're going to cover tonight include, uh, as I mentioned, significant risk factors for breast cancer development, including the gene mutation, methods of identifying individuals who may be at high risk of being mutation carriers, the clinical features of the syndrome, and management options, as well as how to interpret the results. And I've got actually some samples that we'll look at uh, to see what those look like when they come back and what the implications are of those various results. And then how to utilize that information to the benefit of the individual who's affected. So <clears throat> a lot of uh, press has been given to a variety of factors that can impact a woman's, pre predominantly a woman's risk for breast cancer. Most of those have to do with um, hormonal issues. As Dr. Bernstein mentioned earlier, how old a woman was when she started having menstrual periods, how old she was when she went into menopause, how many times she was pregnant, took a break from being uh, ovulatory, use of hormone replacement after menopause. Um, but as you can see from this slide where it's so nicely graphically displayed for you there, the relative risk consequent to those issues is fairly small compared to some of the other factors, such as a history of having had previous chest wall radiation for lymphoma, for example, particularly if a woman was fairly young, late teens, early 20s, when that occurred. A finding of atypia on a biopsy that may be done for calcifications or some kind of abner radiographic abnormality. Um, and also, increased breast density, as, uh, as Dr. Bernstein mentioned, is a huge, huge factor we're finding more about all the time, that at least quadruples a woman's risk for breast cancer if she's got those very dense, uh, fibrous-type breasts. But when it comes to the genetic mutations, as you can see here very clearly, that multiplies an individual's risk for developing, a woman's risk for developing breast cancer by 10 times, which is obviously huge. So uh, this little slide has, is a nice depiction, if you will, of nationally kind of uh, what it would look like in terms of <clears throat> individuals at risk because of a hereditary mutation that they carry um, versus these familial the familial breast cancer risk. And, and by familial breast cancer risk, what we mean is that these individuals are walking around with you know, their grandmothers, their aunts, their sisters, their mother, everybody had breast cancer in the family. All the females had breast cancer in the family, but we can't find a gene mutation. When we test these individuals, they don't have a gene mutation. But they are still at significantly much higher risk, and potentially for genetic reasons. There are other genes that carry a risk or are associated with a risk for breast cancer that are not the specific BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. They don't have 10 times the risk, but they're down in that 4 to 10 range, somewhere in there. So <clears throat> folks who have a uh, personal history of breast cancer, a fair number of them are at risk of being carriers for the hereditary mutations that can bump up their risk for both breast and ovarian cancer. 
100% of women who have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer um, are at risk of being carriers. <clears throat> and we'll go into those numbers a little more shortly. But by breast cancer, what we mean is either a diagnosis of invasive cancer or a diagnosis of ductal carcinoma in situ, which is sort of pre-invasive or not yet invasive cancer, but cancer cells are there. By ovarian cancer, what we refer to is the um, cancers of the ovary, but also cancers of the fallopian tubes. And some women will actually develop tumors that are ovarian cancer in the lining of the pelvis, um, even after the ovaries have been removed on occasion. And those are included uh, in that risk status. So um, within different populations, then, you will see a fair number of individuals that are at risk. In one study that looked at a primary care practice, um, they found that about 9% of the patients in that practice were at significant risk of being uh, carriers of a genetic mutation that would bump up their risk for breast or, and or ovarian cancer. <clears throat> Additionally, in just a mammographic screening population, just women going in, you know, with, uh, to have their annual mammograms. We used to do annual mammograms. Now we sometimes do every other year on mammograms, depending on your philosophy on that. But um, amongst that population, as many as 6.2% uh, were at risk of being BRCA carriers. So <clears throat> amongst all the different... Uh, Hereditary issues then, as I mentioned, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 are the major uh, gene mutations that we look for, that we deal with in this uh, population. And then, the, as you can see, 84% of, uh, of the hereditary breast cancers that we see are going to be attributable to one of those two genes. And there are some slight differences in terms of the subsequent risk for... Um, ovarian cancer versus breast cancer versus some other associated cancers uh, for people who are mutation carriers. And then there's all those others in that big black box. So how do we figure out who we're going to worry about? Well, there are a variety of uh, professional associations that have put together recommendations um, regarding who should be tested and um, <clears throat> what the appropriate setting is for genetics counseling and those sorts of things. And they're all basically along the same guidelines. The one in the middle, the NCCN, is the one that most of us follow. And it's also the guidelines that the, most of the insurance carriers, Medicare and Medicaid use in determining whether or not they're going to uh, pay for the cost of testing, which is a, uh, it's not a cheap test to do, but it's, uh, as you will see, a very important piece of information for individuals who are affected. So these are the red flags. These are the things that we look for when we're taking a history from a patient, um, and, and particularly the family history, to help raise our awareness that potentially there could be something going on there that we may want to look deeper into with a blood test or a saliva test history of ovarian cancer in the family, breast cancer in the family, especially if diagnosed before the age of 50, two primary breast cancers in one individual. Male breast cancer is a big red flag as well. Male breast cancer in the general population is extremely, extremely rare. It's supposed to be about 1% of all the breast cancers that we see, but I don't know about your practice, Eric, but I'm seen far less than 1% of the breast cancer in males in my practice over the years. Um, triple negative breast cancer has recently been identified also as an indicator potentially for genetic component to that individual developing breast cancer. If there's pancreatic cancer in the family in association with one of the other HBOC cancers, with breast cancer or with ovarian cancer, not necessarily in the same individual, but within the same group of blood relatives. Um, that is a red flag. The Ashkenazi Jewish 
ancestry as well as we now know in New Mexico, northern New Mexico, the Sephardic Jewish uh, heritage is uh, a red flag as well as any family that has had a previous family member um, who's tested positive for one of these genetic mutations. So, what is the impact then of this finding? <clears throat> well, the BRAC mutations significantly increase the risk for development of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, for, and for women who develop breast cancer as a consequence of this inherited abnormal gene, um, their risk of developing it at a very young age is extremely high. As you can see from these graphics, in the general population, uh, only about 2% of women will develop breast cancer by the age of uh, 50. Uh, but 50% of BRCA carriers will develop breast cancer at an extremely early age in the, in the, in the premenopausal years, basically. Over the course of a woman's lifetime, by the age of, and we estimate that for our purposes here, at age 70, 87, as many as 87% of BRCA carriers will develop breast cancer by the time they reach age 70, which is huge. That means only 13% get by without breast cancer. Um, ovarian cancer, as you can see, the risks are not quite as high. Ovarian cancer in the general population amongst women who are not BRCA carriers um, is extremely low, well, less than 1%. But it's as high as 44% for women who carry that mutation. Additionally, women who are carriers of the mutation who are treated for one breast cancer are extremely high risk of getting another breast cancer. Um, in particular, as many as 27% will get breast cancer within five years of treatment of the initial breast cancer. And uh, by age 70, again, 64% of them will have either recurrence in the same breast or a cancer in the opposite breast. Uh, when they're carriers of that mutation. And as many as 13% will have ovarian cancer within 10 years of diagnosis of their breast cancer. Additionally, as I mentioned previously, there is an increased risk of certain other cancers as well. Um, for men in particular, the breast cancer risk is way higher at 8% than in the general population. And their risk for prostate cancer is significantly higher than the general population. 20% as you see there versus 14%. Additionally, men who are BRCA carriers who get prostate cancer tend to get a more aggressive form of the disease. And for that reason, they should not be put on a protocol of observation, regardless of how minimal their disease may be at the time of diagnosis. They need aggressive therapy. They need either radiation or surgery for that prostate cancer. <clears throat> I mentioned previously the, the pancreatic cancers um, are much more common in families who carry the BRCA mutations, uh, although pancreatic cancer is a relatively rare cancer, um, both in affected families and non-affected families. Um, if there has been, however, a family member who has had pancreatic cancer in, in a <clears throat> population that's identified as, as carrying the uh, the abnormal genes, then the other family members should be offered screening examinations with CAT scans and that sort of thing. Additionally, melanoma, which is unfortunately fairly common in northern New Mexico where we have so much sunshine and we're at such high altitude, um, the risk is double in bracket carriers for developing melanoma at some point. Okay, so what do we do about this? Well, there are basically three options, um, <clears throat> which sometimes we use in combination depending on a given individual's uh, point in their lifespan and, and goals for their life and health and a variety of different issues. Um, we sometimes use surveillance in circumstances where that a particular individual is identified as being a carrier, but they're not yet ready to go with more aggressive uh, methods of reducing their risk. 
prophylactic surgery, which we'll look into a little bit more here, is the most effective method of keeping these individuals healthy and alive uh, for the, a normal lifetime. <clears throat> and then the third option is chemo prevention, and we'll look at some statistics on that as well. So <clears throat> surveillance uh, basically consists of, <clears throat> for breast cancer, teaching the individual involved how to do a very good self-breast examination and <clears throat> urging them to do that on a regular basis at least once a month. We offer them clinical examinations in a breast specialist office every six months. We generally combine that with some kind of radiographic study. We do mammograms usually only once a year because we don't want to expose people who are already at high risk for breast cancer to extra radiation. So at the next six-month interval, we offer them breast MRI. Breast MRI has been shown to be extremely effective in screening for early changes that can lead to breast cancer, particularly in women who are at high risk, whether it's for BRCA mutation or for other uh, familial issues. With ovarian cancer, <clears throat> the uh, results of surveillance are far less um, effective and therefore always make practitioners nervous. Um, but for individuals who decide for their own reasons that they need to postpone undergoing risk-reducing surgery, um, we do offer them regular pelvic examinations, um, transvaginal ultrasound, and check a CA-125. Although, as a lot of you may know, the CA-125 isn't always helpful in there's not a good radiographic study uh, to pick up early stage ovarian cancer. So if an individual decides then on reducing their risk by undergoing surgical procedures where the majority of the breast tissue is removed, we usually combine that with a reconstruction procedure at the same time, um, and the ovaries are removed along with the fallopian tubes, they significantly reduce their risk for breast cancer. Doing the mastectomies alone reduces that risk as much as 90%. Removing the ovaries alone reduces the risk of breast cancer as much as 68%. And reducing and removing, I'm sorry, the ovaries reduces the risk for ovarian cancer as much as 96%. If you combine removal of the breast tissue with removal of the ovaries, you bring that individual's risk for breast cancer back down to that of the normal population. And that's huge when you're talking about that kind of risk. So we'd like to uh, identify people young who are carriers of this because that's when we can have the most impact in terms of bringing that risk down as far as possible and giving them the best hope of remaining healthy and well for a very long time. Preferably, if those individuals can undergo removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes by age 40, they're going to statistically get the most benefit from that surgical procedure. Statistically, if they have the breast tissue removed by age 25, they get the most benefit. But trust me, it's really hard to convince women when they're that young <laughs> that they're at that kind of risk uh, and that the numbers are really worth it in those terms. So occasionally we do get into situations in where we t we're talking with people about chemo prevention, ways to help protect them, hopefully on just a temporary basis until they're ready to move forward with more aggressive risk reduction. Oral contraceptives, as it turns out, reduce the risk of ovarian cancer by as much as 60%. Now, because of all the information that's out there about taking hormones and breast cancer risk, a lot of folks worry about taking birth control pills might increase their risk for breast cancer, but that has never been demonstrated. Um, and lots of numbers have been looked at by lots of folks over the years, trying to see if there's any correlation between taking birth control pills and uh, breast cancer risk. And 
there are very few studies, there's a lot of conflicting information out there, but, but there's nothing solid to say that that is the case. And in fact, we occasionally use uh, oral contraceptives in people who had breast cancer for a variety of different reasons. Um, the hormonal therapy that Dr. Bernstein mentioned earlier, tamoxifen, um, the aromatase inhibitors, and another drug out there called Avista have been shown very clearly to uh, reduce the risk of breast cancer. Tamoxifen particularly uh, reduces the risk of contralateral breast cancer by as much as 50 some percent. Um, in the STAR study, they showed that the obesity and tamoxifen both significantly reduce risk in high risk women of developing breast cancer, somewhere along the lines of 50 to 60 percent. Um, so occasionally, individuals will make the choice to go on one of these medications uh, to try and reduce their risk for one or the other cancer for a certain period of time. And in my uh, clinical experience, Generally speaking, um, a woman will, for her own reasons, be ready to do something surgical in one realm, but not in the other. So sometimes we do one operation and put them on the drug to try and protect them until they're ready for the other operation. But as you can see, neither of these come anywhere close to reducing risk the way surgical removal of the at-risk tissue does. See this okay. So male breast cancers, you know, we don't have any standard protocols uh, at this point in time in terms of <clears throat> screening or, you know, recommendations for males who are carriers of the gene. Um, but it's probably reasonable to do things along these lines, you know, getting a baseline mammogram, especially if they have any kind of nodularity or any breast tissue. Uh, at all that they're concerned about, um, you know, doing a good physical examination on a regular basis. Um, we certainly don't recommend to them that they take the drugs to reduce their risk and, and that sort of thing. But basically just try and keep a really close eye on them and then approach things surgically if something develops. So test results. Oh, I wonder if we can do this. Um, so basically, the test results come back in one of three forms. Either they will be positive uh, for one of the two uh, major mutations, or they will say there's no mutation, which is always a fun day. I had one of those today. I had a chance to share with a lady and say, look, there's no mutation. And that's, that's a great, great feeling. Um, or occasionally, you'll get something in between. The, they call it a... Um, variant of uncertain significance. It's a genetic abnormality that's been identified over the years, but not yet clearly characterized as being uh, deleterious to the extent that the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 are. And basically what they're doing with those is enrolling those individuals currently in, some, in a registry, and they're gathering more and more data on people that have this kind of uh, variant and then looking to see what happens over the years to figure out which ones are bad and which ones are not. Um, and we've seen a few of those folks out there so far. None of them have gotten cancer, hooray. And uh, so far, most of the uh, follow-up uh, communications from the laboratory have indicated that they were not deleterious uh, variants and those individuals could go about their life as if uh, they were just normal human beings. So, <clears throat> there, uh, there's another thing I need to do on these slides, and I'm not sure how to do it with your control. <laughs> um, or if you need to do it from there. Maybe if I did, let me try pushing it again. Okay, here we go. That's fine. I was hoping to actually open is there a way to open those, to click on those little things and open up that page so they can see what the reports look like? With the mouse, maybe? No? Okay. 
sorry, you don't get to see what they look like. But they really are fun, especially when they come back and they say, negative. Okay, so <clears throat> the implications then of the results of these studies are depicted here for you. Um, for individuals, obviously, who have a report that comes back, yes, there is a deleterious gene identified there. They're in that column uh, with the big red thing that puts their risk at as much as 45 or 50 percent for ovarian cancer, almost 90 percent for breast cancer. For individuals in a family where a BRCA gene has been identified previously, where we've tested them for that specific gene because we knew exactly what we were looking for, and their test comes back negative, their risk is the same as the general population, 8 percent over the course of their lifetime of developing breast cancer. Those people can go home and breathe easy and get a mammogram every year or every other year and see their doctor for annual screening and they don't have to go through any other mess. They're done. But for the folks in between, the familial group, those little black figures we saw before, the people that have all these cancers in the family but we don't find a BRCA gene there, their risk is somewhere in between, in 50 to 40 percent range. And those individuals do need to be follow very closely. We don't generally offer them prophylactic surgery to reduce their risk because it's not nearly as high, um, but they need to be undergo that frequent surveillance that uh, we went over before and even consider chemo prevention under the right circumstances. So these are the same numbers then for ovarian cancer to show you the impact of a positive versus a negative with a known BRCA gene mutation in the family versus uh, somebody who's got all these family members but nobody's been tested and so they're the first one you're running into and you test them and you say, well, you got this familiar risk and it's, it's high, you know, it's, uh, it's something to, to think about and to keep an eye on. And those individuals might also consider uh, birth control pills as a, as a risk reducing maneuver. So <clears throat> the benefits of hereditary cancer screening and testing then are that it allows the individual to consider their specific risk for breast cancer and determine what measures are most suitable to their circumstances uh, for dealing with that risk. The limitation is, though, that bracket testing does not identify all genetic, all inherited risk for developing breast cancer, those familial cases that we talked about before. So we ask our primary care docs to help us screen for those red flags, to talk to patients about testing options um, under the appropriate circumstances. Um, we help our patients then to work through all of those issues, um, establishing a, a plan for how they want to deal with their circumstance if they're in the positive category or if they're, they've got that familial uh, but unknown risk for breast cancer and how they want to deal with that. And we also offer testing to other family members. Um, First, second, third degree relatives are all eligible for testing whenever a, a BRCA mutation is identified in the family. Because the knowledge of what's going in your body gives you the power to make those decisions and take control over your life. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Zerbach. And uh, uh, could could Drs. Bernstein and Zerbach come up on the stage here, and we're going to pop two chairs up here on the stage, and you can answer some questions. And my first question will be, neither of you talked anything about radiation. Where is that, where does that come into play? Um, and here, we'll let you sit here and answer some questions here. Great. Oh, good. Okay. There we got it. Okay, so radiation, uh, and maybe you want to use this uh, microphone also. Um, there we go.
go. Great. For initial treatment of breast cancer, um, radiation plays a role in that, you know, for a long time all we had were sharpened uh, stones and then we advanced to knives and then surgery got really good. And our really first effective tool for breast cancer was mastectomy, so removing the breast. And there was a large study that showed if we do surgery where we just take out the mass, so a lumpectomy, with radiation afterwards, the survival is the same for early stage tumors as mastectomy. And so that's breast conserving surgery, we call that. And so that's in early stage breast cancer what we use radiation for. We also will use it for if lymph nodes are involved, then you should get radiation in an adjuvant fashion for your lymph nodes um, if you've had a mastectomy. And if there is a margin, so when they cut the tumor out, if there was cancer going up to where they cut it, we will use radiation in that setting as well. So that's for the settings that we're talking about with people who are newly diagnosed with breast cancer. For people who already have breast cancer, we use radiation to treat areas that are particularly causing problems. So if you have one area that is growing and is pushing on a structure that's important like your spinal cord or that is causing pain in a bone, we'll use radiation in those settings. Um, or for disease that is in your brain, we'll use radiation in those settings. So that's kind of a brief overview of the right. For Dr. Bur uh, Dr. Zerbach, uh, is genetic testing covered by medical insurance? As I mentioned during the talk, um, as long as the individual circumstance meets the guidelines, which is basically those red flags, if you've got enough family members that have had breast or ovarian cancer, um, you know, or some of those other issues involved, then yes, most of the insurances, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, will all cover the cost of testing. And how about uh, prophylactic surgery? Uh, does insurance cover that or reconstructive surgery? They do, um, and not because they know the results of the test, okay? That's not something that we share with the insurance companies. They will know if, you've, uh, if they've submitted a request for payment for the test, they'll, they'll know that you've been tested. But in my office, they will, from my office, they will never know what the result of that test was. But individuals who are candidates for testing for hereditary breast cancer are also appropriate candidates for prophylactic surgery, even if they tested uh, regardless of what the result of the test is. Um, in a family where a BRCA mutation is identified, as I mentioned previously, if those individuals test negative, then they're at normal baseline risk for breast and ovarian cancer, and they don't need surgical intervention. But you know, the families that are in between, according to insurance standards, are candidates for prophylactic surgery if they choose to do that. So the insurance company can't interpret from the fact that you've made a decision to have surgery what your results are, and we never show them the results of the test. But anything that, that's done along those lines is generally covered uh, by the insurances, by Medicare, and by Medicaid. Do re for Dr. Bernstein, do regular x-rays or mammograms over your lifetime increase the risk of breast cancer or ovarian cancer? Um, so with ovarian cancer, no, unless you were, I mean, if you had regular abdominal radiation exposure, you could theoretically increase your risk of ovarian cancer, but um, uh, probably the most well-studied population for that don't have ovaries. I mean, the people who, who've gotten the most regular CT scans of their abdomen are testis cancer survivors, actually, who've been well-studied, because we get a lot of CT scans in those patients, and we always try to minimize the number of CT scans, but when they go back and look at, is there a correlation between the number of CT scans and who gets abdominal cancers much later, so 20 years later, there's not a correlation between those. In terms of breast cancer risk, um, you know, the beauty of uh, the randomized trial, okay? So I don't think oncologists or anybody else are that smart, 
you got to prove your theory, right? Everybody comes up with a great theory. Usually it'll work. Every once in a while they do. So in medicine, we have something called a randomized trial. You get a whole bunch of people. You flip a coin. They go into two groups. So we know that people who get mammograms are much less likely to die of breast cancer. So are there rare breast cancers that are caused by exposure to radiation from that? The answer is yes, but they're extraordinarily rare, and that the number of cancers that are caught early and that women don't die from far and away outweigh any increased risk of breast cancer. So, you know, is there a theoretical risk and an actual real risk, but very minute, of radiation causing breast cancer if you start getting mammograms at age 40? Yes. Does that compare to the number of lives that are saved if you get mammograms? No. It's inconsequential compared to the number of lives that you will save by getting the mammograms. Right. So that was a really long answer. So for Dr. Zerbach, uh, what is your opinion on annual mammogram versus more than once a year uh, in between for non-BRCA carriers? Well, <laughs> I'm pretty old school in that regard. The new digital mammography that we're doing now has a significantly lower radiation exposure. Um, but for a woman who develops breast cancer and it's caught at a later stage versus an earlier stage, as Dr. Bernstein uh, explained to you earlier in his talk, that significantly increases their risk of having recurrence of breast cancer and dying of their breast cancer. Um, I would much rather see a woman with ductal carcinoma in situ that was picked up because of some itty-bitty microcalcifications that I couldn't even see on the mammogram um, that we were able to remove and prevent that woman from having invasive breast cancer throughout the course of her lifetime than having women go every two to three years and, and potentially having much later stage disease at the time that they do finally show up and get that mammogram done. They're so low cost, the risk is so low. Granite compression's not fun, we've all been there and done that and it's not fun, but it's worth it if it saves your life, in my opinion. For Dr. Bernstein, is asking your doctor for your numbers an easy question for the doctor? Um, depends on the cancer. So it's a lot easier, honestly, for breast cancer because of tools like Adjuvant Online. For breast cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer, those are pretty easy questions to answer because they're online tools that do this, basically a multivariate analysis. So you put different factors about the patient into a computer algorithm that gives you those numbers. And the reason we're able to do that is those are very common cancers. We don't see hundreds of people with those cancers. We see hundreds of thousands of people with those cancers over time. And so we have good numbers for those. For other cancers, I mean, you know, uh, I have patients with rare cancers where, you know, uh, it's hard to find someone else who's had that cancer. Um, and, you know, in all honesty, uh, make stuff up. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I have people who there are five cancers that have been reported like that. You know, I don't have good statistical data on those people. So it depends what kind of cancer you have. But for breast, colon, and lung, it's not that hard, and you should be able to figure that out pretty quick, and I think as patients, you deserve to have that. For Dr. Zerbach, uh, do BRCA mutations pass through the mother and, and the father's genes, and does having a grandmother with breast cancer increase your risk? The uh, BRCA genes are um, autosomal dominant. They can pass from either side of the family. You can get it from your father, you can get it from your mother. And when there's a, a BRCA mutation in the family, then the children of that carrier, each child has a 50-50 chance then of inheriting the gene. And when they inherit the, inherit the gene, it generally expresses. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the second part of the question. What, a grandmother? No, the grandmother. If that's the only family member that's had breast cancer, and particularly if they were elderly at the time, then your risk of having a genetic mutation in the family is extremely, extremely low. Okay. Uh, for Dr. Bernstein, all of your examples were estrogen uh, positive tumors. Um, 
for the type of negative tumors, what about the risk factors for the negative tumors? So, and I think they, I think that must mean risk reduction. So, because if you give uh, adjuvant hormone therapy to people with estrogen negative tumors, so people who don't have the estrogen receptor expressed on their tumor, there's no benefit. So, it's a little bit of a simpler graph. There's no benefit from hormone therapy, and chemotherapy would give you some benefit depending on your stage and the characteristics of the tumor. Um, I used estrogen receptor positive tumors partly because the Oncotype DX test for that example doesn't apply to estrogen receptor negative tumors, although occasionally I've seen it ordered um, uh, in that setting. It's really designed to be used for estrogen receptor positive tumors. Um, and the other reason is to show that both hormone therapy and chemotherapy can have a benefit. When you put them together, it's not an additive benefit. It's a little smaller together. But you have to think about both of those in each person. But if it's extra receptor negative, it's easy to figure out hormone therapy. It doesn't help. How about for, along those lines, if you're the first female in the uh, family with a history of breast cancer, uh, and if you have sisters, should you all have genetic testing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For the first uh, woman in the family to develop breast cancer, if they're under the age of 50, we offer them genetic testing. Um, if that individual tests negative, then the other family members don't need to be tested. But if it turns out that they are a carrier, and occasionally, especially in families where there are a limited number of females, um, you know, because other relatives have died or there are just not that many females in the family, it can be hard to ascertain um, you know, a specific pattern that would indicate a uh, hereditary uh, component to their breast cancer. So generally if they're postmenopausal, if they're roughly age 50 and beyond, and they're the only one in the family, we usually don't offer testing because the risk for being a carrier is less than 10%. But if they're under age 50, then we definitely do. For Dr. Bernstein, uh, is it recommended or suggested or a good idea for the ovaries to be removed if a person has a history of colon cancer uh, with met METs to the liver? No. Um, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't think that you would take the ovaries out if you have colon cancer with METs to the liver. Uh, yeah. Does having ovarian cancer increase the chances of having breast cancer? <laughs> Definitely. As, as we mentioned in, in talking about hereditary disease, 100% of individuals who have had ovarian cancer are at risk of being mutation carriers. So those individuals should, in my opinion, be offered testing to see if they are a carrier. Doesn't mean that all of them will be carriers, but they are at risk of being carriers. So in those individuals who test positive, then yes, they are at significant risk of developing breast cancer over the course of their lifetime. For those who test negative, then no, they are not at increased risk. And for Either of you, does the CA125 test work as a baseline for detecting ovarian cancer, in your opinion? No. The problem with CA125 is it basically measures irritation in your abdomen. And the, the cat's out of the bag. So it, it, it's a test that is nonspecific. You can have other things that can irritate your abdomen and elevate that test. And it also catches things after they're already quite late. Um, so it's, in my opinion, doesn't serve much of a role in surveillance for the most part, but there's a lot of debate about that. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's a thing that, you know, you can get multiple different opinions and none of them are wrong because none of them are right. I mean, it really is a test that is difficult to interpret and some people do it, some people don't. The science is mixed. Do oral contraceptives uh, help in the general population of reducing ovarian or breast cancer in the general population? There's a small decrease in the risk of breast cancer. Ovarian cancer, I don't think there's a... There's a decreased risk for ovarian cancer. Actually. For ovarian cancer. But ovarian cancer is... The risk for ovarian cancer in the general population and people who are not mutation carriers is so low that... We don't generally recommend taking it. 
taking birth control. Because birth control pills have some risk. I mean, there's a risk for uh, uh, blood clots and, you know, other issues uh, where birth control pills are concerned. So we don't normally recommend those except in the circumstance where people are genetic mutation carriers and are at extremely high risk for developing ovarian cancer. So in, in people with the positive uh, BRCA mutations, um, in thinking of them, is there any lifestyle changes that could have been made uh, to affect that? Well, we suspect that the individuals who are carriers but don't get breast cancer until they're 80, or the 13% who never get breast cancer, that it probably has to do with lifestyle factors. Um, and that they were able to somehow um, avoid some of the other issues that impact uh, the conversion from normal breast cells to cancer cells uh, as a consequence. But nobody really knows the answer. And, you know, obviously living a healthy lifestyle is a good idea for everybody. And lastly, uh, for Dr. Bernstein, could you explain atypia? The atypia finding on a breast biopsy, what it is and how it relates to risk? So atypia is a technical term for funny looking. Um, atypia basically means atypical so that they don't look like normal cells and that there's not enough tissue, well, and that they're, and that they're not cancer cells. So they're funny looking. Um, and usually atypia is either found in specimens that are clearly not cancer, but that um, are, you know, a, an adequate specimen, or in small specimens. So when we do uh, a fine needle aspirate, which is only sometimes a few cells, they can be somewhat suspicious. And, and there's, they'll describe them different ways, but basically atypia means not normal, but not cancer. That was, that, Dr. Zerbach could probably do a better job of describing that for you because he's a surgeon, but I mean, that's kind of the way I think of it. Atypia is sort of like, oh, well, it's not normal, but it's not cancer. Great. Thank you so very much for an outstanding uh, evening, and be sure you turn in your surveys, and thank you very much for attending. <laughs>